Gosh, looking around here, shouldn't you all be in matric? <laughs> oh boy, it's nice being older than you. Um, it took some time. Uh, this is a, a good year for me because it's my 70th year. And uh, I just see that... I just see the... The number seven, though, is a good hook to hang product on. <laughs> okay, so that's what it's all about, because inside, 14. <laughs> because I started losing my hair when I was 15. And I think God, in her wisdom, took away my hair, otherwise I would have been a hairdresser. <laughs> I love the subject. I mean, I know Philip, when he wrote to me, and he said, unfortunately, the subject is ugly. I don't know how to combine you and ugly. Oh, excuse me. I mean, look what I'm wearing. Some people might say, God, that's ugly. Well, to hell with you. I like it. <laughs> In fact, I think the trousers are supposed to be pajamas. I bought it at Woolworths. My egoda fun suit to hell on me. <laughs> ugly is interesting because one never thinks of ugly. One just thinks of what's behind ugly. I mean, for example, language is fascinating. I mean, the word fuck in Afrikaans means subject. <laughs> And in English, it means object. <laughs> it's all about what you see. And I think ugly is always in the eye of the beholder. And so many ugly things have actually inspired me to try and find something less ugly within that mess of politics, of prejudice, of fear. I, unfortunately, I don't think I have a sense of humor. I really wished I could tell jokes. I'd love to tell jokes. I love jokes. I, I always remember the punchline. And then I start with the punchline. <laughs> and I laugh, and people say, and? And I think, oh, God, I don't know what to do. But you know, fear is a terrible reality. Fear is so successful that eventually we close our eyes. And I was brought up in a beautiful country with exquisite privileges without an opinion, because an opinion was something one wasn't encouraged to have. Peter, play still. Peter, what brought you? You must still play. Children are supposed to be seen and not heard. And then eventually they said to me, are you trying to be funny? Yes! <laughs> Desperately. <laughs> it took me till 45 years to form an opinion. I'm not joking. And it wasn't even in South Africa. I was in Australia. It was in 1986. Hmm? I was the white South African in Australia doing a funny show about apartheid. Hey, that doesn't make sense at all because it wasn't about apartheid. Nothing about apartheid was funny. Absolutely nothing. But the hypocrisy around it was very funny, purely because it was so appallingly successful. And there I sat on a live TV show in Australia. It was about 11 o'clock at night. I thought, yeah, it's late. <laughs> These people have been drinking since eight. <laughs> what am I going to do now? And the guy wasn't very interested in me. He sort of knew he had to do a job. And he said, OK, Peter, OK, so you're a, you're a satirist in South Africa, a white satirist in South Africa. Um, what would you do if you were black? I thought, no, man, you're not supposed to ask me that. You're supposed to say, where does Evita get her clothes? <laughs> Because that's what they asked me on SATV. Oh, Peter, why do you want to wear a beautiful dress? Well, Lim, they want to wear a beautiful dress by Chris Levine. And suddenly, I had to answer a question live, and I didn't know what to say. And the little green man behind my brain blurted out, well, I suppose if I was black, I would be in Lusaka making guns. He said, oh, yeah, that's a good answer. Went on to the next question. Within two hours, I got a phone call from my father from Pinelands, totally hysterical. He said, he police is you. 
And slowly I just realized that, my goodness me, I have to stand out of character here. I have to not hide behind the eyelashes and behind the dress and behind the high-heeled shoes. I have to actually also have an opinion. And it got me into a lot of trouble because people said to me, oh, we don't want to hear what you say. And there was a critic in Johannesburg who has died. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And this critic always said, oh, I saw Peter de Geese's new show, and oh, my goodness, every now and then he has to give his opinion. We don't want to hear his opinion. Do you know, he's probably right. And that's a lesson I've also learned. You don't stand up on stage and wag your finger only unless you're going to do a character. <laughs> because entertainment is the word here. My goodness me, I'm an entertainer. People give me all sorts of names. Activist, no, I'm an actorvist. I like that, actorvist, which means I can't spell the word properly. But an entertainer means that I've got to take you out of your real world of horror and ugly, your real world of tension and stress, and all those words are meaningless because we created them to fill a gap. Stress is, what is stress? Stress means you're tired, take a discipline. Or just sit a bit. Has anybody allowed themselves to sit for five minutes once a week and think of nothing? Have you tried that? Do you know how important that is? It is the most important thing in the world. We don't have time for our brains. We are so busy rushing, rushing along the highway. And I've just come from the Hydra in Stellenbosch. I go to the Hydra, and that, all right, I'm 7-0, so we do go to the Hydra in Stellenbosch. <laughs> I've been doing that for a long time purely because my instinct has said to me, you have got to take your car in for a service at least once every six months. And this is my car. And I've got to check the battery and the oil and the water. We don't do that. And when I went into the hydro 10 days ago, I weighed 90 kilos and today I weigh 83 kilos. And it's got nothing to do with weight loss. It's all to do with what's up here. Because this controls everything. In there, you can do anything. Steve Jobs proved it. In here, anything is possible. Sophia Loren, who is 80 this year, in here, incredible. Have you ever seen tits like that in an 80-year-old woman? <laughs> and she will forgive me for using that word, 80-year-old woman. <laughs> you know, I have been unemployed since 1975, and that was the greatest gift that the apartheid government gave me. They told me to shut up. And they said, if you don't shut up, we'll stop you. And so I didn't shut up. And they stopped me, and I've never stopped shouting ever since. And I've been unemployed for all those years, and now nobody can afford me. <laughs> and the greatest freedom of being unemployed is, if you do something, anything is possible. If you do nothing, nothing will happen. Nobody is out there to do it for you. The moment you depend on somebody to do it for you, it will not be done. It will be done, but it won't be done. Don't lose control of your madness. And that's the best word that anybody's ever said to me. Every now and then I say to people, do you know, I went, ah, I was going to McGregor to v look at it because I've never seen it. And, and I had a few hours and I thought I'll go and look at McGregor. Uh, and I ended up in Darling. I mean, what a, how did I get to Darling? I mean, it's like going to China and ending up in Brazil. <laughs> I took a wrong turning and I've been in Darling for 20 years as a result. Talk about a mistake that really was the beginning of the rest of my life. And I said, I've gone to Darling and I've bought a house. And, I'm, and there's the old station. And I'm going to turn it into a theater in Darling. And people said, oh, Darling, you're mad. And I thought, yes, when people say that, they haven't thought of it. They haven't thought of it. If people say, oh, what a good idea. Then you're standing in the queue. None of you in a design center want to stand in a queue. You want people to say, Jesus, are you out of your mind? Yeah. Totally. Out of my mind so my mind could get on with it. You don't just smother your mind with prejudice and fear and say, oh God, I'd love to do that, but I better not. Self-censorship is the most terrible disease, self-imposed disease. I mean, I went through censorship during the apartheid era, and really in the beginning, it was absolutely horrible when some overweight white Christian person came into your theater and said, stop, and you had to stop. Why? Because you are obscene and blasphemous. Yes, I used the word achiere once. And obscene, ach, I said kak and poop twice. 
But you see, I also used the word apartheid is wrong, and that was, mm -mm. but they didn't get me from that. They got me on the swear words. Die fistelike taal, sis. You don't have to say ugly in Afrikaans, you just have to say sis. <laughs> And in the beginning, it was grim. My dad threw me out of the house. We lived in Pinehurst. He said, Fat your communist is a cock at my eyes. He was scared. He was scared for my life because he has relatives in government and they phoned him and they said, Hannes Opas for your sin. And he said, Nimu leke. Hannes Opas, you gaan your house verloor. Jij gaan your house verloor. Your daughter is in London. Ach man, ons wil jy sy moet ongelukkig wees. I mean, come on, come on. It's not only in James Bond movies you hear that from men with gold teeth and white cats on their lap. But then I discovered the weapon of mass distraction called humor. Nobody expects to remember what they laugh at. And I realized that the one thing that I have to do to keep myself relatively insane is to laugh at my fear. And if you laugh at your fear, you make that fear less fearful. It's never going to be less lethal. It can still kill you, but at least you have got your eye on the bugger. And when you look your fear in the eyes, it'll never be taller than you. Never. If you look away, it'll become as high as Table Mountain within 10 minutes, and you will never turn around to face it. And it will control your life. Every single day, the news breaks in the palm of your hands. Every single day, it's a roll call of death on every level, in every street, in every society, in every country, in every world. We can't have that all the time. So there are moments that you've actually got to say, hang on, just give me 10 minutes here with what I want to do. I want my little list also to be ticked off. That's my obsession. No, it's not. Yes, of course it is an obsession. I've got to sort my life out, so I make lists. I make lists of lists, and eventually I've got 16 A4 pages that go into 2016. <laughs> Funeral being the last one. <laughs> and you've got to organize that because you don't want to be hijacked by the NGK again. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> A great idea is to be cremated and then put your ashes on the spaghetti and everybody come and have lunch. <laughs> <laughs> and here we are 20 years into a democracy that no one ever thought would happen. We whites actually got away with apartheid. Can you believe it? We got away with it. There was no Nuremberg trial. None of us was hung like Saddam Hussein for crimes against humanity. A man came out of the darkness and gave us light. Today is the 1st of February, and tomorrow is the 2nd of February. Meaning, 25 years ago, a conservative, white, racist, verkrampte Afrikaner stood up in Parliament and changed the world. F.W. de Klerk changed the world. No matter what people think about him today, and many people think many things, and everything has to be explored because he has not answered all the questions. The fact is, he had the key to that door. Nobody else had the key to that door. He opened that door and everything changed. And now they've given him a street. <laughs> <laughs> no, but wait a minute. If he hadn't opened that door, they would have named an airport after him. That's what the National Party did. And so one has always got this extraordinary thing of, yes, you are, wait, no, are you, wait, no, mate, balance. Always the balance there. Ba the good and the bad, the light and the shade, the black and the white, the ugly and the not ugly. I thought I'd lost my job in 1994. I mean, suddenly I was Burtalus. I was bereft of Burtas. I thought, oh, oh, okay. Okay, I must get a job. Can't draw, so I can't come here. What can I do? I'm, no, no, I'll think of something. I've got a degree. Oh, what am I talking about? I went to the University of Cape Town to get a degree to fall back on. <laughs> do they still say that? <laughs> oh, come on, you can't be serious. When the hell are people going to start saying, get a degree to fall forward on? Why always that retreat mentality? Your dream will never come true, so get a degree to fall back on. I have a BA drama degree. The most pointless, useless thing I own. <laughs> because when I'm on stage, nobody's going to ask me for a degree. You can either do it or you can't do it. There is no affirmative action in theatre. <laughs> and so in 1994, I thought, well, I better find something to do. And I would have found something to do. And suddenly I looked up and there stood Nelson Mandela. 
Nelson Choliklachla Mandela. Gosh, the anti-apartheid movement must have been grateful for that easy name, Nelson. <laughs> Imagine, free Choliklachla. And I looked at him and I thought, how do you make fun of Nelson Mandela? It's like doing Mother Teresa with a dildo. You can't do that. <laughs> And yet Nelson Mandela's great sense of humor <coughs> inspired me to look for the mock in democracy and expose the con in reconciliation. And let us always remember the sense of humor of Nelson Mandela because that changed the world. Many things he did change the world. But the fact that he smiled, that smile, the most extraordinary smile you've ever seen in your life. The sun shone. I mean, where would we have been today if Nelson Mandela had come out of jail really angry? God, he had all the reasons in the world to be bloody angry. How would you have felt in jail for 27 years for what you believe in, away from your children, your wife goes mad? <laughs> Nelson Mandela could have so easily come out of jail and spoken like Robert Mugabe. He could have come out and said, to hell with democracy, take the farms and kill the whites. And yes. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of whites and a few colors and Indians would have been killed. The Indians who pretended to be Italians. <laughs> and nobody in the world or on CNN would have looked in our direction. But he did not say that. Nelson Mandela smiled, formed a government with the people who locked him up, spoke Afrikaans, sang the stem from South Africa. I think he was a a national party mole in the ANC. <laughs> Reconciliation. Reconciliation was sprinkled over the ugly of our diet. 20 years later, we still blame apartheid. Do me a favor. 20 years later, we blame the lack of electricity on an ugly system of government that no longer is there as a legal way to control people and kill them. Crap, it's like in the 60s, blaming Adolf Hitler for the miniskirt. <laughs> and I look at you, and you're not born free, so I think you were around in the old days, but it's tiny little people. I love this new generation in South Africa. I am so excited, that's why I'm one of you. I'm also a new generation, I'm also a born free. Every day I'm a born free. Every day I stand up and I think, Jesus, I am going to stay free today, even if it kills me. And it might, because I do cartoons. <laughs> Je suis Peter. <laughs> Freedom is such a word. I'm free. It is my right. Right is such a word. Whoever reads the Bill of Rights? Does anybody read the Bill of Rights? Has anybody read the Constitution? Do we have any idea what we have been given? to exploit for us to live? No, we don't. I want a house free, it's my right. I can throw shit at somebody because it's my right. Oh, excuse me, don't be such a minus 10 IQ crap. Then again, criticism. Hey, 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 you're a white person. Don't criticize blacks. I don't criticize blacks. I criticize assholes and idiots and fools who are all sorts of colors and all sorts of sizes, and I don't care about that. If they do it wrong, I'm going to say, excuse me, I think it's crap, the thing you're doing. But that doesn't travel. You see, you're not going to leave your house and come and sit in an audience for me to start shouting. I have got to make you laugh and think, God, those people is doing a real crap. And then you realize I'm doing you. <laughs> there is no blueprint for where we are going. Make no mistake. Do not be lulled into a sense of achievement. There is no achievement until you have realized that what you have achieved is the brick that you build the wall for the future. Success is a hell of a prison. If you succeed, you are trapped in that prison because they want you to repeat that success. And you can never repeat that success. It's a carbon copy of that success. And it smells different. It's really the failure that creates a future of success. And it's a crap word as well. I hate the word failure. It sits badly in your mouth. You go, bleh. It just didn't work. That's all. Come on. Hello. It didn't work. Okay. So why didn't it work? Make, check it. And I look back on my life as a writer of plays, and I've had great success. 
in the days when people went to plays, I have to spell it out to you, people went to plays to sit and listen to a story. Now you just go, <laughs> and there it is. No? <laughs> and the few plays that didn't work, didn't work because I listened to advice. God, protect yourself against advice. <laughs> Listen to all the advice because some of it isn't terrible, but most of it is rubbish. Because the people who give you advice are actually not looking at you, they're looking behind you to see what more they can talk about there. Advice is dangerous because I was brought up to believe that older people knew better. <laughs> now that I'm an older people, I'm telling you not true. <laughs> and people said, Oh, yes, you've written a play in two acts. No, darling, it should be three acts. And you're yes, he says, Ya wum, ya tan, the disease to please. It's more fatal than the Ebola virus. Don't please anybody. Please yourself. And don't please yourself because don't be satisfied with what you think is good. When I was at the film school in London, because I was determined never to come back to South Africa, because I saw BBC documentaries in 1970 on the BBC where my generation of white Afrikaners in uniform were shooting black children in the back, down the road in Langa and Nyanga and Guguletu. I saw that on television and I thought, it's all communist propaganda until somebody said, no, you're the fucking Nazi. Get the fuck out of the bar. Nobody had ever said that to me, except my father. <laughs> he didn't say that to me. He pushed me with tears in his eyes. And then I suddenly realized that, oh my goodness, I have to really, truly do my homework here. I cannot just listen to what people say. I've got to find out what was behind all this. And once you find out what is behind your fear, you can understand that your fear is a smokescreen that you have got to try and blow away with the air of laughter. What do I mean by that? I mean, every single moment of the day, we just inhale out of shock and horror. <gasps> but when you laugh, <sighs> if you don't do that, you explode. <laughs> Liberate yourself. Feed your sense of humor with a tickle and a hug. And really, truly, when you toast your achievements, when you toast your country, when you toast your failures, make sure that your glass is half full and never, never, never. Okay.